Now, the next part of this chapter has to do with the nuclear model of the atom. Uh, and the history behind this started off with a guy with a really fine mustache and beard here, whose name was William Crookes. And he was quite an experimentalist. He loved to get in the laboratory, build things, and try things out. Uh, and he built the first example of uh, a what we call a cathode ray tube. He took a glass envelope, looked something like this, hooked it up to a vacuum pump. He had put a couple of metal electrodes in there. On the left side uh, was something called the cathode, which is a negative electrode. He connected that to the negative part of the power supply over here. And then there was a, what, something called a ring anode, which is a, uh, a, a simply a circular piece of metal with a hole in it. He hooked that up to the other side of the power source. And what happened was interesting. Uh, when he turned the lights out and he put some phosphor-containing material down on the end, if he made the hole in the uh, anode, the positive electrode here, if he made the hole circular, he got the image of a circle down here. And if he made it square, he got a square. If he made it a triangle, he got a, uh, a triangle down here. So something was moving from this section, the left-hand section, presumably from the cathode, and going to the anode. And some of those somethings were going through the hole and traveling in straight lines down the tube. The air was pumped out, so it was a vacuum in there and uh, striking this phosphor on the end. Well, this was puzzling. Uh, he called these things cathode rays because they came from the cathode. But he didn't really have a good explanation for what they were. Uh, keep in mind that part of Dalton's theory was that atoms are indivisible. Couldn't break them down. Okay, so. Um, there was a lot of thought about whether these things were atoms or what they might be. So uh, several experiments were done. Lots of experiments were done. One of them found that the cathode rays were deflected both by magnetic fields and electric fields. So this suggested that whatever those things were in that ray, they had a charge. And uh, they were able to determine the mass to charge ratio of these things, suggesting they might be particles. And this is a number here. You don't have to worry about the number. But notice it has a negative sign. Mass can't be negative, except on Star Trek. Uh, and therefore, the charge must be negative for whatever these things are. Uh, so that was filed away. And more observations were made. And a critical observation was that the properties of these cathode rays did not depend on what he made the electrodes out of. He could make them out of aluminum or gold or tin or copper. It didn't matter at all. The properties in this number came out the same. Well, you have to conclude from that that whatever he was talking about in the cathode rays was, a, was contained in all atoms, right? Or else the battery was pumping it out. Uh, but basically, they were able to determine that the cathode rays were universal in all metals that they tried. Uh, so um, the particles then were assigned to be a subatomic component of metal atoms. Right? They were attracted. The beam was attracted to a positive plate and deflected by a magnetic plate in such a way that it had to be negatively charged. And that uh, confirmed this negative sign right here. Now, um, a physicist, a British physicist by the name of J.J. Thompson, uh, decided that these particles must be components of all atoms. And he called them electrons. Uh, this went over like the proverbial lead balloon. Almost nobody believed that these were really subatomic particles. Because atoms are indivisible. How, how can it be that uh, we have broken down these atoms? Uh, the cathode didn't seem to be adversely affected. 
Uh, and so uh, suffice it to say that this was viewed skeptically by most physicists of the day. Well, this was about um, 1897, 1897, late 1890. About 10 years later, another experiment was done on these particles, which, as I say, were by then called electrons. This was done by a physicist by the name of Millikan, and he used this apparatus, which is a container that has two chambers within it, and uh, one chamber is given a positive charge. The top chamber here is a positive charge. It's a metal chamber, and it has a hole in it right there. And below that, there is another plate which has a negative charge. So the region between these um, has an electrostatic field that is uh, operating through it. So they used uh, an atomizer over here, and they squirted a fine mist of oil droplets. This is called the oil drop experiment. So these are oil droplets into the top container. Now these oil droplets are neutral, small, spherical particles of oil. And some of them would fall through the hole right here. And when they fell through into the bottom part of this apparatus, there is an X-ray source here which emits high-energy rays, and those rays strike the air that's in this container. And it was known that they could cause, these high-energy X-rays could cause electrons to be knocked off of air particles. This was controversial, but eventually it was accepted. Uh, and so electrons, free electrons, were on the air molecules in this region, and some of them attached themselves to the oil droplets. Over here on this side is an observer with a microscope who has control of the voltage, uh, the positive and negative uh, potential across these two plates. And the, the person can adjust those. Now keep in mind, electrons had negative charges, right? So that made these oil droplets negative. And down here on the bottom was a negative plate. Now, Coulomb's law says that a negative charge is repelled by another negative charge, like par charges repel, right? So by adjusting the voltage here, the observer could affect the dropping of these oil drops. In fact, if done carefully, you could suspend the oil drops in space. And this was a very good thing because at that point then they could write down an equality. The equality was the force of gravity on the oil droplet is exactly balanced by the electrostatic force that um, gravity is going down, the electrostatic force is going up, and this would allow them to calculate the charge on each oil drop. Okay, so it was found there were different charges on the oil drops. They were not all the same. Um, and so this had to be interpreted. But it was relatively straightforward. The observer looked at individual oil drops and took the information for each one. And what they found was that all the oil droplets had charges which were whole number multiples of some minimum charge. Some of the oil droplets had this minimum charge. Some had two times the charge, some had three times the charge, and so forth. So uh, the analysis of this was simple. The oil drops pick up one electron or two electrons, or maybe three electrons, and uh, the minimum charge then must be the charge on one electron. And in fact, when they calculated this, it was minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus two, uh, 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Coulombs is a unit of charge. Uh, or a number within 1% of that. This is the current number, and Milligan's number was very, very close to that. So Milligan had uh, uh, proved uh, that electrons come from atoms and that the charge on electron was uh, about this value, negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. Wow, that's a pretty small number. If they took 
Thompson's mass to charge ratio and multiplied it by the charge, they figured the charges would cancel out and they'd get the mass of the electron, and they did, and uh, it turned out to be approximately 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. An incredibly tiny mass. And from this, they were able to see that this is much smaller than the mass of atoms. And so this sort of nailed down the idea that electrons are subatomic particles. They are so small uh, that um, they certainly couldn't be viewed as, as an atom at this point. So then um, at this point, the question was, what, what's going on in um, the atom? How, what's the structure of an atom? We know there are electrons in there. They're negatively charged. So, what positive charge? What what positive charge is there that balances them? Because atoms are neutral. Okay. Uh, also, electrons have a tiny mass compared to the mass of an atom. So, what makes up the rest of the atom's mass? Well, science works by making some sort of a proposal. And in some cases, we call the proposal a model. Propose a model and um, make the model fit the experimental results and see whether the model is universally acceptable or, or not. Well, J.J. Thompson proposed a model. And you might have heard of it. Sometimes it's called the plum pudding model of the atom. What he said was, Imagine that all of the positive charge and the mass, most of the mass of an atom, was spread out through the entire volume of the atom, and the electrons were uh, positioned in it, avoiding one another, one assumes, uh, like plums and pudding, or maybe raisins and pudding. Electrons are pretty small, you see. Uh, so this, this was Thompson's model, and it it awaited somebody to test it. When you make a model, um, it sometimes, if you're, if you're a big enough name in science, sometimes it gets tentative acceptance, but it's going to be tested. Every model is always tested. Uh, it's up to the brightest people to figure out good tests for any model. You probably heard of string theory. String theory is what might replace quantum mechanics eventually. That matter is all made up of these incredibly tiny strings. And depending on what kind of strings are there, uh, you get different kinds of matter. But the strings are so small, you can't divide, uh, devise an experiment to see one. And you, there's no way to test this. And so this is holding back string theory right now. I don't know very much about it, but I think uh, it awaits somebody to test it properly. Well, in this case, the first test that was worthwhile was conducted by one of J.J. Thompson's uh, students uh, by the name of Ernst, uh, or Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford um, proposed uh, the following experiment and conducted it and carried it out, I'm sure, with the help of his boss. He started with three components, a piece of lead, a lead block with a hole drilled in it some uh, photographic film set up in um, uh, almost a circle here, and a piece of gold foil. Uh, the idea was to put a radioactive substance in the lead block and make the lead block a, a gun for alpha particles, make a beam of alpha particles. Okay, So alpha particles were high energy uh, particles that came from radioactive materials. They were several ta thousand times heavier than electrons, uh, and they came out with very high energy, extremely high energy. So the idea was, let's, l let's see what happens when these alpha particles uh, go through uh, a, a metal foil, in this case gold. Uh, now, what happens when these alpha particles hit the gold depends on what gold atoms are like, right? If we use the plum pudding model, each gold atom would have all its mass and its positive charge spread out diffusely through the whole atom. And uh, a, a gold foil would have these atoms compressed into uh, um, 
almost a two-dimensional uh, foil here, okay? Pretty thin, not too many atoms thick. So the question was, if, if that's the case, these high energy particles ought to just go right through that gold foil with very little deflection, okay? Pretty much like rifle bullets through uh, cardboard or something, all right? So what happened? When they conducted the experiment, over a period of time, they watched where the uh, alpha particles came through because they made a, um, an impression, uh, they darkened the film here a little bit. So when the, uh, most of the alpha particles hit this gold foil, nothing happened. They went straight on through and made um, a flash back here. If this is, um, uh, this could be either photographic film or it could be a fluorescent material of some kind. Now, um, nearly all of them went straight on through, and I'm sure initially they were elated because it suggested that the boss's model was probably right and they were all going to become famous. Uh, but after a while, some things happened. There were some deflections. There were flashes that appeared to the left and to the right of the center line. The question was, how far can you carry this as... Uh, when you say almost no deflection, does that mean one degree or two degrees, or would 10 degrees be part of this? And so they kept the experiment running, and after a while, they actually saw flashes coming back from, from the foil. They saw flashes on the screen in front of the foil. Well, this nailed it down. Too bad the boss's model there's no way the boss's plum pudding model can do this because the mass is not concentrated where it could cause an atom, uh, an alpha particle to deflect. It's, it's all very uh, evenly, homogeneously distributed, okay? So the data were that most of the alpha particles weren't deflected at all. One in 20,000 was deflected by more than 90 degrees, however. So if you think about what that means, it means essentially that um, the deflection must occur by the alpha particle hitting a concentrated mass. Uh, and this would, the mass would be concentrated not in the plum pudding model, but in what we call the nuclear model, where most of the mass and the positive charge uh, in the nucleus of an atom occupies a tiny, tiny uh, uh, section, uh, part of, of the atom. Now, uh, the picture of this that uh, shows what would be going on here would be if gold atoms were composed mostly of electrons out here in the outer part, and then some heavy particles making up most of the atom's mass were concentrated in uh, a part of the atom about one ten thousandth of the um, diameter of the atom itself, extremely tiny, uh, then that would account for the fact that occasionally one of these alpha particles would hit the thing directly and come bouncing back. Um, Rutherford said he was never so surprised in all his life when this happened. He said it's equivalent to taking a cannon and shooting it through a tissue paper and having the shell bounce back at you. Uh, so uh, much was he uh, conditioned to think about the boss's model. So here's a summary of what Rutherford's results suggested. The volume of atoms are mostly occupied by these very light electrons that can't reflect any alpha particles. The only thing that can reflect the alpha particles is, is this tiny region uh, of the atomic, called the atomic nucleus it contains all the positive charge and nearly all of the mass of the atom. Uh, and so when an alpha particle runs into it, uh, it is capable of causing deflection, even if the alpha particle has very high energy. And the fact that alpha particles have positive charges and these nucleus had particles in them called protons, uh, which had positive charges, made the reflection even more prominent. So. Rutherford's model, once all the analysis was done, explained the charge nature of matter. It ex 
explained how the matter could be arranged in atoms to account for the experiment. But when they did uh, close calculations, they found out that they didn't account for all the atoms, the gold atoms mass. Some of it uh, was, was simply not there. And it wasn't until somewhat later that a physicist by the name of Chadwick discovered the other particle in the nucleus called the neutron, which has about the same mass as a proton, but has no uh, positive charge, no charge at all. This made up the missing mass, and everything then was uh, uh, okay.